Okay, so welcome back everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Scott Sheffield. Um, so Scott, I'm just going to say a few words about Scott. He's uh, obtained his PhD at Stanford in 2003 under the direction of uh, Amir Dembo, who's actually in the audience. Um, and after that, he spent a few years first at uh, Microsoft and then at Berkeley before getting a position at the Current Institute at NYU and then finally moving to MIT where he's still based at the moment. And so Scott has worked in many areas of probability theory, but in particular, and most recently over the last sort of four or five years, um, he has mainly worked on the study of a number of random conformal invariant objects. So for example, he's known for his joint work with the uh, tram where they showed they related the level sets of the Gaussian free field to a certain type of schwamm leuvner evolution. Um, and also for his proof with uh, Duplantier of the KPZ formula. And more recently, the last few years uh, with uh, Jason Miller, he has obtained a series of uh, monumental results where they developed first a whole theory of flow lines for the Gaussian free field, which they call imaginary geometry. And then they've defined or they've invented a new class of um, random conformal invariant object called the quantum Leuven evolutions. And very recently, uh, they together with uh, Bertrand Duplantier, they just put an article on the archive, which is going to be the topic of today's talk. And so he's going to talk about Chinese dragons and mating trees. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's very good to be here. Um, so I'm going to start by going over what I call the cast of characters. Uh, first, uh, some fractals from complex dynamics, Julia sets, things of that sort, and I'll uh, talk about how they became popular and uh, show some images of those. And then discuss how we can use some ideas that evolved in the theory of complex dynamics to study certain canonical random fractals that have been important in the statistical physics and quantum field theory literatures uh, over the last few decades. Um, and so these include uh, canonical random trees, a uh, certain most natural way to choose a random tree, canonical random surfaces. It turns out there's kind of a canonical, if you like, most natural way to choose a random two-dimensional manifold uh, that has fractal properties. And I'll explain that. Um, also random paths. It turns out, well, everyone knows the canonical random path is Brownian motion. But if you want a path in the plane that doesn't intersect itself, so it's a random planar path, then somehow the canonical random way to do that, if you like, is uh, to construct it using these uh, so-called SLE surfaces. And they're discrete SLE, evo schramm leuvner evolutions, SLEs. And I'll explain that as well as some discrete analogs of that. And then there are also canonical random growth processes that have evolved to try to study uh, everything from snowflakes to coral reefs to cancer cells. And, um, and so I'll explain how all of these things uh, emerged and uh, how you can construct them all mathematically. Um, these things have in common that most of them are very old. I mean, certain aspects of them go back 100 years or so. But they became very popular in the 1980s uh, as personal computers became popular. And as more and more researchers were able to program and actually see what these things look like. So these are two-dimensional objects. And we'll see a lot of pictures and images. And, um, and indeed, in two-dimensional random geometry, unsurprisingly, computer visualization has played a major role in the field. Um, uh, and after I introduce all these objects, I'll go into part two, which is the drama, where we actually see that by combining some of these objects in perhaps surprising ways, ways that are related to uh, constructions from the complex dynamics literature, we can uh, understand all of them 
on, I hope, a, a somewhat deeper level. Um, and uh, this is based on a number of articles, uh, um, several of them with, with Jason Miller in the audience, and also this most recent one is joint with, uh, with Miller and uh, Duplantier. Um, so just these references here is about 900 pages of work all together. And of course, there's more behind that. So I'm going to have to talk rather quickly. I figure I have to do about a page every four seconds. And I've, <laughs> I've wasted some time now. But, but anyhow, I'll give you, a, I think, a reasonable overview of, uh, of the highlights of the theory. OK, so if, like me, you were a high school nerd in the late 80s, early 90s, um, you and your friends probably occasionally gather together to look through books like this and write fractal codes in C on your computer. Um, and you learned how to generate, in particular, something called the Julia set. So um, Julia sets go back to 1918, but they were, uh, again, became very popular in the 1980s, uh, as Mandelbrot, in particular, uh, uh, kind of brought them to the world. And you consider this map phi of z equals z squared. Let's start with this case. This maps the complex plane minus the unit disk to itself. Right? I mean, it maps the whole plane to itself. But in particular, if you start with something whose modulus is bigger than 1, then its square will have modulus bigger than 1. So it's a conformal map, in particular, from the complement of this unit disk to itself. And it's a 2 to 1 map. And uh, if you apply repeated iteration, any point that is out here in this complement of the unit disk will kind of drift off to infinity. And any point that's on the boundary of the unit disk will kind of stay on the boundary of the unit disk. Um, so it kind of the set of points that go off into infinity is this set that gets mapped to itself. And this set D, or the closure of D, is this, this set that stays bounded. Um, well, you could do this if k is another compact set with a connected hole. Um, for example, if k is a square, here we have, you can map the complement of the square to the complement of the disk. Then you can apply this lovely 2 to 1 map up here, or 1 to 2, no, 2 to 1, that's right, map up here. And, um, and then, apply the inverse map to here. And so the, convolution, the composition of these things gives you a, a 2 to 1 map on this side, which is rather similar in the sense that it maps the boundary of this to itself and maps everything outside to itself. And um, if this is a square, you can construct this map with schwartz christoffel You know, if this is any linear thing, there's a nice procedure for constructing the map. But they started to get a little complicated, the more complicated this k gets. And you might think that if if k is a complicated set, then this map, where you map over to here, apply the 2 to 1 thing map back to here, would also be complicated. But it turns out some of the most complicated choices for k have some of the simplest choices for this 2 to 1 map. In particular, <coughs> um, suppose we just say we want our phi k, this map, this 2 to 1 map from the complement of k to itself, to just be a polynomial. And let's just say, even simple, let's just say it's just z squared plus a constant c. So we just take that as our map from k to itself. So then k will just define to be the set of points that this thing leaves bounded if you repeatedly iterate. So we just kind of repeatedly iterate and say what points stay bounded when you do that. And the points that go off to infinity is the complement, and we have a 2 to 1 map from that complement to itself, which you can kind of check. It has to, these points go off to infinity. It looks like the square map in infinity. So it has to be the 2 to 1 conformal map from the complement of this region to itself. OK, and, um, and there's a measure on the boundary of that crazy set that it inherits from the boundary of this. Um, we have some pictures of this for you. So alternate tab should take me there. Uh, let's see. Yes, this is from the internet, Google Images. Type in Julia sets, um, and it brings up uh, a bunch of these. You can also find Julia set crop circles, Julia set tattoos. 
are actually surprisingly popular. There are hundreds of images of, of Julia set tattoos, um, <laughs> which were not really appropriate to show here. Um, but uh, you know, here this is an example of, of one of these sets. This is the, the set of points that, uh, that get fixed, that don't drift off to infinity. And we have this nice map from the complement of this to itself. Here are others. And these all depend on the value of c that I chose. Um, but as you see, these are, these are very simple objects. And sometimes they think of nice ways to color them. Like you can uh, <coughs> you know, draw circles over here and then conformally map back to the complement of k. And then those circles become these uh, boundaries of these sets where they, they kind of change color. And so you get these, this coloring of the, of the complement uh, that can be quite nice. And now let me show you something else that uh, they've done. And this is, these are some simulations due to um, uh, Arnold Sherita. But um, and the story was, uh, you know, so Milner particularly has a very good uh, exposition of this. So this is something that was the complex dynamics of the 90s. Um, they discovered that in a certain sense, you can sometimes mate together two of these random fractals. And what that means is, I told you this fractal comes with a natural boundary measure that it inherits from D. And you can take the points on the boundary of this and identify them with the points on the boundary of this, just according to that measure. So this gets mapped to here, this gets mapped to here. And then I can kind of glue these two guys together along their boundaries in sort of a measure-preserving way and try to sort of dip the whole thing into a sphere. So the picture will explain it better than I can. So here is Sherry Ta's beautiful animation. The boundaries are getting glued together in this fractal way. Boom. And at the end of the day, you have these pair filling up the entire sphere and a, a path that sort of snakes in between uh, the blue and the yellow. So this gives you a kind of very interesting fractal path that kind of snakes between these two guys. <clears throat> Here's what happens uh, if you do the same thing with a pair of fractals where one of them, well, let's let this spin for a minute, and then we'll <laughs> move on. Yes, here, one of the fractals is actually a tree structure. And so at the end of the day, once these are glued together, the, the tree still will occupy a space of Lebesgue measure zero. So this thing kind of fills up all the space. And you get this tree somehow tracing the boundary. You can kind of think of this as taking your, your big fractal on the right and kind of gluing it to itself with some sort of a lamination of the boundary that is described by the tree. OK, but again, you know, I have this structure with some sort of interesting path that kind of snakes between the uh, the two objects. Um, and again, these are both Julia sets. So some Julia sets have the property that they look like the one on the left. They have big bubbles sort of stitched together. And some look like the one on the right that are basically trees. They're, they're tree-like objects. Dendrites, they call them. OK, and so um, it's like, this is. This is a picture, though, where you just have two trees. And here you might think, you know, how can this work? I mean, both of the trees have measure zero at the beginning. But actually, when they snake through, at the end of the day, what you have is a space-filling path. So two trees welded together, mated together in this way, produce a space-filling path. OK, and how do they actually make sense of that? Well, when you think about it, you have your crazy fractal k. And um, so k is, is now one of these you know, weird, weird, crazy sets. And I tell you that if you take a, any region here, say, say this guy here, the map that sends the plane to itself is this nice polynomial, z squared plus c. So if I look at the pre-image of this disk under that polynomial map, the pre-image of this will be some pair of, of disks somewhere else. 
And the pre-images of these will be some, some four guys. And what you'll find is that so the, the structure in this neighborhood looks like the structure in these guys up to a, a conformal map, um, or a polynomial map, actually. So, that, so you get this tremendous self-similarity, where you know, I can repeat that. You know, if I do the k-fold inverse, I'll get two to the, the k little neighborhoods here. And, um, and I'll find that the structure inside each one of these guys looks exactly the same up to a conformal distortion. Um, so you have this tremendous exact self-similarity between these guys. And so this, this wonderful algebraic structure. And um, it turns out that you can sometimes embed this in the plane, in the, in the uh, say, the complex sphere, in such a way that uh, the map, so here there's this, this two to one map. When I pull it up to the sphere, I had a two to one map for one of my fractals, a two to one map for the other. When I pull up here, I'll get a two to one map on the sphere. And it turns out there's sometimes a unique way to embed the gluing of the two fractals over here into the sphere that makes this uh, two to one map now a rational map on the sphere. And so amazingly, you have a rational map that, you know, that takes this whole structure you see up here, this crazy space filling path, and preserves the path structure, but just maps it to itself in a two to one way. And, um, and the fact that you know, it looks conformal when you, you map from one region to another kind of completely determines how it has to be embedded. Somehow, if you know the conformal structure in one neighborhood, you kind of know it everywhere else. Um, and so you just this kind of unique way to, uh, to embed these guys. OK. So um, let me go back to. Uh, To here? OK. So all right, so you know, thanks to Julia Setz's this work, you know, we've got words like chaos, butterfly effect, fractal, self-similar, into the popular lexicon. Everyone, uh, these are the sort of things you'd read in Time and Newsweek. Everyone was interested in this. Um, and now I want to think about applying these ideas to random fractals. So these will be fractals where we don't have this exact algebraic. Uh, self-similarity, but where there's still some self-similarity in the law of the fractals. OK. And the simplest one we can describe is just a random tree. So in this case, this here is a, a Brownian excursion. So it's Brownian motion from one time to another, conditioned to stay positive. And Aldous, in 1993, explained this idea um, based on some discrete ideas that go back uh, much, much earlier. Uh, but he explained this idea that if you take this uh, object and you just draw horizontal green lines and identify points on one side with points on, on the other side. So anything on the same horizontal line gets identified. So you start with the graph of this curve, and then you glue together points on opposite sides, squash the thing together, you get a tree. And this is a random metric space he calls the Brownian tree. <coughs> and there's a discrete analog. Um, where you can consider a tree embedded in the plane. And um, if I give you a simple random walk, or a simple walk that goes up and down by one step, I can map that to a tree where, as I trace the outer boundary of the tree, my distance from the root goes up and down according to this process. And again, I, I can construct it from, I can go from the graph back to the tree in the same way. I just kind of glue things together under the tree. And so that's a bijection uh, between rooted trees embedded in the plate and, um, and these walks. OK. Second uh, interesting fractal is these random paths. So if I give you any simply connected planar domain D, this schramm level evolution is a random curve that goes from one boundary point of A to another. So it's a random non-self-crossing path uh, from A to B. And it comes with a parameter kappa that roughly indicates how windy the path is. And you want to argue that this SLE, uh, which I haven't quite defined yet, but I want to argue it's in some sense the canonical random non-self-crossing path. Um, and to do that, you say there are certain symmetries that characterize SLE. 
Namely, if I give you a conformal map phi that maps uh, one domain D to another domain, then um, I'm going to say that the law of the SLE here from phi A to phi B is just the image of the law down here. So if I give you any pair of domains, once I've defined SLE on one domain, I can define it on any other domain just by mapping it over this way, because I insist that it, it have this symmetry. Okay, so that's one thing I insist on. Um, but the next thing I insist on is that if I condition on this path up to some stopping time, then the conditional law of the remainder of the path is simply an SLE in the domain given by the original domain minus the part you've generated so far. Okay? If you think about it, that means I condition on the path up to here, and I want to know what's the law of the rest of this path. The law of this rest is the same as the original law from A to B after applying a conformal map from this domain to this domain that takes A to this tip and B to the original B. Well, this is what they call a, a domain Markov property. It's a certain symmetry. And, um, and Odette Schramm showed that these two properties completely characterize SLE up to this one parameter, kappa. And they actually gave it an explicit construction, um, which you don't need to, to read too carefully, but um, it, it's based on something called Lovner evolution, and it's a certain, uh, a certain differential equation that uh, was introduced about 100 years ago. And if you plug in a, a Brownian motion, it turns out that it gives you a, a way of describing this, this fractal curve. <coughs> OK. Um, these are uh, what they call SLE phases. It turns out if kappa is equal, less than or equal to 4, the curve is a simple curve. If kappa is between 4 and 8, the curve is not space filling, but it's also not simple in the sense that it hits itself. It bounces off of itself. And if kappa is equal to or greater than 8, it's a space filling curve. OK. Now, um, it turns out there's a radial analog of this SLE. Um, and again, you have a parameter kappa that fits into the evolution. And this radial analog gives you a way of taking a sphere with a point in the middle, or a disk with a point in the middle, and drawing a path from the boundary to the middle. And the reason I mention this radial version is that there's also a measure-driven analog of this Lovner evolution, which says that, if you like, instead of growing from a single, the path from a single point, you could grow the path from multiple points at the same time. So grow a little from here, a little from here, a little from here, then grow a little from here, 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 and you can grow from many places. And, um, and this idea that you have a Lovner revolution not driven by a point but driven by a measure gives you a way of growing a fractal that's not a path but is what we call a growth process. And this will uh, be relevant when I discuss quantum Lovner evolution a little later in the talk. OK. But first, let me talk about random surfaces. This is next on our list of canonical uh, fractal objects. So a discrete way of doing it, give you a piece of paper. You can all do this at home. Uh, divide it into equal squares. Cut this, right? Get your scissors, cut them all into equal size squares. And then get out some glue and start gluing edges together. And you know, I have here uh, 48 separate edges. And I can just find any way of grouping those 48 edges into pairs. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Are you using American or European paper? No. All right. Well, yes. This is Andre causing trouble as usual. No. Yes, right. So um, uh, assuming you're able to find uh, a piece of paper with uh, rational ratios of <laughs> width to height. Um, you, you, can, you can proceed with, with, with this. And, um, and then you, you, you glue these things together in some way. And I'm going to insist that let's glue it together in some way that I, I form a sphere topologically in the end. So that it's, um, and sometimes I call this the, the drunk quilt maker model. If you're so, someone who's stitching together pieces of fabric to make a quilt, I can't translate that into all the languages we have here, but a quilt is a blanket you make by 
gluing, stitching together squares of fabric. And, um, and if, you're, if you're sober, you make it into a nice grid shape so that you can sleep under it. But if, if you're drunk, but not so drunk that your quilt fails to be simply connected, um, <laughs> you'll produce something that is topologically a sphere. Okay. And there's some finite set of ways to do that. You could imagine you choose uniformly from the set of all possible ways to do that. Um, here is uh, a simulation. This is, I guess I got this from Bertrand. Um, this is actually done with paper and, and glue. Um, and here is uh, a simulation done on a computer with a large number of squares by this Aduta Marker. And you take a very large number of squares and you glue them together and then you try to tell your computer to embed the surface as, surface as isometrically as possible in three dimensions and then kind of show you the projection of that. You, you get something like this. This is some sense of what that surface is going to look like when you actually glue all these things together. And you see it has a lot of wild fractalish behavior. A lot of uh, places, you know, arms that go up far away. It's very far from being a smooth sphere. Okay, so these random uh, planar maps uh, go back to Tut with the four color theorem. And they come in many variants. You can do triangles, quadrilaterals. Sometimes they put extra statistical physics structure on top of them. You have uh, a planar map together with a, a spanning tree on top of it. Or they do something called the easing or POTS model or various uh, statistical physics things. Um, but the simplest case uh, has been shown uh, in works by Schaefer, Legal, Paula Miramon, other people. Miramon, at least, uh, is here or, well, was here yesterday. Um, <laughs> he's here, yes, good, <laughs> accounted for. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, they managed to show that uh, this thing is actually uh, converges to a, a metric space in the continuum that in some sense has fractal dimension four. So there is a continuum analog of this object that's uh, somewhat understood. And um, an important tool in all this thing is certain bijections that send this surface to a pair of trees. Well, okay, so what do I mean by that? So here, here's something that, uh, that Jason, my co-author here, produced. Um, so this is a, another random triangulation, or quadrangulation embedded in the plane. So each one of these faces has four vertices along the, on it, except for the boundary ones, which have three. Um, but in the interior, these are all quadrilaterals. And um, and then you put a tree, including the boundary. This is a, a spanning tree of this set of red <laughs> vertices. So here, um, the red vertices are connected and the, and the blue vertices are connected. And so I can give you a tree that connects so the red vertices, there's a dual graph where they're connected to each other along diagonals. And I can take a spanning tree of that graph, and then there's a dual graph of the, um, of the blues where they're connected to each other along diagonals. I can take a spanning tree of that graph, um, the dual spanning tree, and then I have this pair of spanning trees that are sort of interwoven in some way. And um, here are just the trees without the graph. So I have a pair of trees. Here's the graph again. And here, in lovely color, are the trees together with a path that snakes between the pair of trees. And this should remind you at least somewhat of what we saw at the beginning of this talk. We have something like a space-filling structure, and you have this path that goes along and snakes in between this pair of trees. So the space-filling path sort of somehow describes the interface between the pair of trees. And it goes through all of these edges in order. Um, the way this embedding was actually done uh, by Jason is that he, he first subdivided each quadrilateral into some nice triangulation. Every quadrilateral got the same sort of pattern imprinted on it. Um, and used this fact that if you have a triangulation, there's a canonical way to circle pack it. And, um, and this circle packing is some, in some sense a discrete analog of a conformal map. It, it maps the uh, planar map into the sphere 
in, in a way that is, in a certain sense, is conformal. Um, and, uh, and so if, in particular, if you had a random walk on this planar map, it should upstairs look kind of like a Brownian motion. And you see, again, a, a very fractal structure here. Some of these circles are extremely big, and some of them are extremely tiny, uh, reflecting the fact that when you do this conformal map, some regions that are off of these long little, uh, long little dendrites kind of get mapped to very tiny points here, and others get mapped to very large ones. And you might ask, what's the limit of this picture as the number of circles goes to infinity? Well, there's a continuum version of this construction that is supposed to provide the answer. So first of all, you know that if I give you any uh, simply connected surface, you can map it. So a simply connected surface with boundary, you can map it to the disk with conformal map. Um, and, uh, and this map, you know, or if I give you a, you know, a set A up here, it'll map to a set down here. And um, if I look at the area measure upstairs, that will map to an area measure down here. Um, and, uh, and I can take it so that the area measure downstairs has the form e to the sum function of z dz. So the area measure, you know, the rate on Nicodemus River with respect to Lebeg measure down here is just going to be some positive function, so I can call the log of that function rho. And so, um, so this is what the metric is down here. It's e to some function dz. And it turns out if I take rho equal to 0, then this e to the rho is 1, and I get just Lebesgue measure. But, and it turns out that if the Laplacian of rho is 0, then uh, this thing is harmonic and the surface is flat. And, um, <coughs> and you might ask, if you want your s per random surface, which is somehow a perturbation of a flat metric, you might choose your row to be sort of the canonical perturbation of a harmonic function. So what's the canonical row to choose, which is a perturbation of, of, a, of a flat function? Well, first let me show you what I promised in the slide, these, these David Goose pictures. Um, here is, uh, oops, let's see. Here are some... Uh, Conformal maps from various famous works of art, or your brain, onto a sphere. And again, you can see this thing. Certain parts are very stretched out, and certain parts uh, get, get sort of squashed together. But this, if you like, it also gives you a co canonical kind of coordinate system upstairs. So uh, David Gu has, has these lovely things, like if you ever wanted to put a checkerboard on Michelangelo's David, there's kind of a canonical way to do it. You, you, you can formally map parts of him to the sphere or to a plane, and then you take the grid on that and you pull it back um, to get a kind of nice way of putting a checkerboard up here. OK. So, um, and so the nice thing is you can think of this here as just being a parameterization of some crazy surface. If I want to describe a random manifold, all I have to do is describe this random function rho down here. So this reduces something that sounds incredibly hard. Describe for me a random two-dimensional surface. You might think, well, OK, how is a surface embedded in three space? How I have to, but I don't care about the embedding, so I just, it, it may sound hard. But really, because of this Riemann uniformization, all I have to do is give you a random function, real-valued random function on the disk. And the natural way of doing that is letting that function be something called the Gaussian free field. It's a particular kind of random distribution. Um, in the discrete world, you basically choose a random function from a graph to the real to where the probability uh, of a given function is proportional to the sum of the height differences squared, which means you sort of favor things that are flatter. Sum of height differences squared is small. Um, and penalize things where they're rougher. But there's still enough noise that things in practice do look fairly rough. Um, and this is, in some sense, natural perturbation of a harmonic function. Um, because given boundary conditions, harmonic functions are the ones uh, for which this sum of this distance of squared is minimized. And it converges, as this mesh gets finer, to a continuum object, which we call the continuum Gaussian free field. OK. Um, but this continuum field is not a function. It's only a generalized function. It's a random distribution. But it turns out there's nonetheless a way of making sense of e to some constant times 
the Gaussian free field. And um, uh, where h is a Gaussian field, and then this constant is some value between 0 and 2. And um, this idea was essentially introduced by Polyakov in 1980s. Even in 1979, he had something along this, this line. Um, and it, uh, he didn't think of it exactly the way we do, but, but, uh, but the basic ideas were, were all there. And um, he, uh, you know, it is, you, you can essentially represent you know, any surface by this sort of measure down here. And, um, and once I've constructed this measure, I've made sense of this as a measure, I can then try to, say here it's a measure on the square, I can now try to um, divide the square into little squares that all have the same size. And so the way you might think of doing that is if I give you a big square, I can fix a constant delta and say, let's divide this square into dyadic squares that all have size about delta. If I start dividing it into little squares, and as long as my squares are bigger than delta, I keep subdividing. But any time I get to a square whose size is less than delta, I stop. And I freeze that square. And then I continue going until all the squares that are less have size in this random measure less than delta. And so at the end of the day, I have a whole bunch of squares whose sizes are all less than delta, but the size of their dyadic parents are greater than delta. So in that sense, these squares all have size sort of of order delta. They're a little less than delta. Their parents are a little bigger than delta. It's kind of sandwiched in the middle. So here, I have squares that look in the Euclidean sense, very different size, but in the sense of this random measure, all of these squares are the same size. This should remind you of the circles. They were all the same size in the random surface, but once I can formally map them in, they all have different sizes. And the idea was that this measure, even though these are squares and the other picture is circles, in the scaling limit, the measures are supposed to be the same. OK. Now, as you change gamma to different values, you get different kinds of pictures. So smaller values of gamma will have smaller distinctions between the rich and the poor. But as uh, time goes on, as you know, these distinctions tend to uh, uh, become more pronounced. So when you get larger values of gamma, you'll have places where there's a whole lot of wealth. This is maybe London. And then you'll have places here where you have great big regions with essentially nothing there. And, um, and that's, again, because you're taking a larger multiple of the free field, so the differences between big and small are, are, are more pronounced. OK, and this is a, a, a model of one of these continuum space-filling paths. So it's, it, it should be that when you go back to this picture that um, here, you know, there's this space-filling path that stakes between the trees. That, here I can describe that math path using a color coding. So if I follow these things in order of color along the rainbow spectrum, I, I trace out this random path. And, um, and here I have this similar thing using this continuum, what we call space-filling SLE. It's a version of that SLE object I described for you earlier. And uh, here, um, let's see. Oops. I want to say this same picture is running uh, day and night on uh, Jason's web page in the form of an animated GIF. And um, here it is. This is a random fractal curve, fills up the entire space. OK, they're, they're, they're kind of nice. <laughs> All right. So, um, OK, now finally, random growth process. Here, um, if I give you a, any graph, it's sometimes natural to assign a random edge weight exponentially to each of the edges. And that gives you now a random weighted graph. And that endows the graph with a metric space structure. And um, so Eden in 61 and, and Welsh in 1965 had this particular model. Um, where you can imagine that you, you put this random weights here, and then you start looking at metric balls with respect to this weight. And um, here, these correspond to metric balls 
in this random weight. So this is what's called the Eden model. By the way, the, the boundaries of this are supposed to be described by something called the KPZ growth model, which certain people here like, um, like Martin Heyer and um, uh, Ivan Corwin and um, uh, I see Jeremy Quastel, uh, probably others I'm forgetting. Many people here have, have worked on, on this particular model. And um, Cox and Durrett showed that this, this surface becomes macroscopic, or sorry, becomes convex in the, in the, in the limit. Sorry. It converges to a deterministic macroscopic shape in the limit, which is convex. So if I run this you know, a trillion by trillion, this, these things will start to look more or less like, well, it's not exactly a sphere, but something, a, a deterministic roundish shape. And um, it doesn't seem to be exactly a Euclidean disk, but it's, uh, but it's kind of close. <coughs> okay, and here's, an, and it turns out that if you think about it, in this model, each time I grow, I can imagine kind of growing my ball, and uh, each time I have a ball of some size, as I gradually increase, the next vertex to be added is uniform among the set of all neighboring vertices. This follows from a certain Markov property or memoryless property of the exponential distribution. So I just kind of, each step I, I randomly choose a new neighbor from the set of boundaries of the cluster I have so far. And, and there's a variant of this structure. So again, we start with a point. We randomly add neighbors to existing <coughs> points to make the cluster bigger. There's a variant where I choose the locations for the new neighbors from the harmonic measure of the boundary, meaning I run a random walk from far away and stop when it hits the boundary. You think of this as a snowflake. A snowflake is some crazy structure. And then a new particle does a random walk from far away, new little particle of moisture. And when it hits your snowflake, it, gl it glues onto it crystallizes and then adds in a new location. Another particle <coughs> comes and adds. You might think sort of mineral growth, uh, like you know, many, many things might have this, this property in nature that they would be roughly like this. And there are other variants where you take uh, the harmonic measure to some power, and these are called the um, dielectric breakdown models, with where eta is the power of harmonic measure you, you use. Um, here is a, a picture of that DLA version, where you start with a point, you run a thing from far away, stop when it hits. Run from far away, stop when it hits. And as you see, um, here, you tend to, if, if a, an arm starts growing, then it's also more likely to be hit in the, in the future. So, so there's sort of a self-reinforcing. Once it starts to be non-circular, it wants to be even more so. And so you get these kind of dendritic patterns. So this thing is roughly roundish. Um, this is introduced by Witten and Sander in 81. Um, you know, it's a kind of a roughly uh, roundish overall shape, but then you have the, these crazy fingers, dendrites. Here this is in nature, this is from Wikipedia, this is a coffer sulfate solution, DLA. Here's two-dimensional DLA, this is something on the patterns that, that develop on the surface of rock, magnesium, <coughs> magnesium oxide. Um, this is what we, they call a frozen lightning bolt. You take a piece of plexiglass and you run a huge amount of voltage through it. It's boom, like a lightning bolt, literally. It just goes right through it, and, uh, and then the effect of the lightning is to sort of burn these patterns into your glass. And so even after the, you turn off the electricity, this, this is what you have left. You can go buy these online, by the way, these, these, these lovely uh, images, plexiglass. They're rather expensive, but, um, uh, but they're very beautiful. Um, okay. This DLA has been extremely well studied in the physics literature. And, in some sense, DLA is, is an example of the failure of, of mathematics, by which I mean there are about 12,000 papers uh, online discussing diffusion-limited aggregation, in quotes. On the other hand, I went through the first 500 of them and only found three or four in math journals. And the reason is that mathematicians have tried very hard, and there's not very much you can prove about this thing. It's a very, very hard model to get your hands on. And so physicists say, well, rather than wait for mathematicians to prove theorems, we'll just simulate these things. You know, we want to know uh, what happens if you have this type of molecule and if you add this sort of noise to your system and whatever. Well, you could try to prove a theorem, or you can sit down at your computer, type it out, and see what it looks like. And that may even give you more confidence as to what the real world will be. And so they've sort of moved on in the simulations, leaving us 
just to watch. And, um, well, I mean, that's not entirely true. Uh, so, you know, there are a few things. Um, so, Schramm in his 2006 ICM proceedings, where he controversially declared that Kesson's result was essentially the only theorem in this, uh, uh, in this field, um, Keston proved a, a bound on the size of DLA. He showed that after n steps, the, the diameter is at most n to the thirds. Okay. But that's it. We don't have the exact fractal speed of the growth. Um, we only have this kind of very limited thing. Um, okay, so what about DLA on random planar maps or on um, unbelievable quantum gravity surfaces? Well, now we get to the drama. Okay. So, first piece of drama. We had the theory of random surfaces, Louisville quantum gravity random surfaces, uh, introduced by Poyakov, inspired, by the way, by uh, string theory. He wanted to know the time evolution of a string. He wanted a Feynman path integral formulation and said, if you integrate over all time evolutions of strings, you're integrating over a space of two-dimensional surfaces embedded in space-time. And so let's integrate over the space of all surfaces. So we need a random measure on surfaces. Uh, he came up with these random surfaces. If you take two of these random surfaces and glue them together along their boundaries, and then conformally map the result to the plane, the interface between them becomes an SLE curve. So in some sense, take two random surfaces, weld them together, map to the plane, interface is canonical curve. Well, since I told you these things were canonical, it may be not be so surprising, but, um, but you know, it was, it was a bit of a trick to prove. So that's, and, and with Jason now, we, you know, we've, we've generalized uh, this um, uh, even further. So, and with, with, with Bertrand, Duplantier, so, so you take various kinds of quantum surfaces, glue them together, and you get new different surfaces with various kinds of SLE uh, on top of them. The next story is you, you can actually make random trees. So if I give you two random trees, you can draw horizontal lines under both of them, and then draw vertical lines identifying them with each other. And that corresponds over here to sort of identifying the boundaries of these guys. This is like what you saw in those um, simulations by Arnold Sherita at the beginning. But now, instead of doing it with these nice conformal objects that have all this conformal structure, uh, algebraic structure built in, I'm starting with just these random tree objects, and I'm gluing them together. What is the resulting structure? Well, it turns out that on one level you can give the answer. You get a sphere, topologically, with a space-filling path. And the fact that this is a sphere can be introduced, um, we call it a piano sphere, by the way, this uh, name uh, came up in a conversation with Richard Kenyon in Paris. So you can blame him if you don't like it. So piano sphere is this sphere together with a space-filling curve, a special space-filling curve that it comes with, which sort of endows the sphere with more structure than it would have just as a topological sphere. And the space-filling structure is essentially just traced through these vertical lines in order, or if you like, trace the boundary of this in order, that gives us that magical space-filling curve that traces through the sphere. So, this theorem of Moore is a general theorem that tells you when, if I take a sphere and put an equivalence class, equivalence relation on it, when is the result still topologically homeomorphic to a sphere? Okay, I won't say too much more about that, except there are certain conditions that do apply in our case. And, um, <coughs> okay, and, and so you have, you know, these equivalence classes. Some are just vertical lines. There are some equivalence classes where you take a horizontal line together with the vertical lines off its endpoints. You can understand all these equivalence classes. And um, it turns out, and this is the result of this 200-page paper that's now online. So it's, it's non-trivial, at least for us, to prove that when you glue together two trees, the result uh, can be embedded in the Euclidean sphere in a canonical way. It comes with a conformal structure, and when you embed it, what you get is Louisville quantum gravity. So here, this has a canonical measure, which is just the measure along the boundary. The, um, 
I mean, I, I take the Euclidean measure on this interval, and the, the, the region filled in a length of time d, or, or in, a, in a, say, a, a length a of time, is, is just defined to have area a. So you fill unit space and unit time in the space filling path. So that determines for you a measure. And it turns out that measure is real quantum gravity, and this is a space filling SLE on top of it. And there's another analog where instead of using Brownian motion, you use jump processes. And in that case, you get uh, a welding of these, space of these uh, trees, which looks like this other thing I showed you at the beginning. And it turns out when you glue those together, the interface becomes one of these non-space filling, but still self-intersecting SLE curves. OK, so now this gives you a completely different way of understanding uh, what SLE is. Um, SLE is what you get by taking the, a pair of trees, gluing them together, putting the canonical conformal structure on it, and looking at the path. That's space filling SLE. <coughs> and non space filling SLE, well, if it's the simple non space filling SLE, you just take two random surfaces, glue them together, look at the interface. If you want to get the brand of space filling SLE that bounces off of itself, you take two of these trees of little quantum surfaces, glue them together, and, um, and then you get this interface between them. Okay, so again, random surfaces, random trees, random paths, it all ties together. And again, what ties them together are these notions from conformal geometry that came out of the complex dynamics literature in the 80s. <clears throat> okay, now we get to QLE. Random growth on random surfaces. What if you wanted to make sense of one of these DBM or DLA models on a um, Louisville quantum gravity surfaces, surface? So we showed we, you can take a structure like this, and instead of doing <coughs> DLA growth on a grid, do it here. Still run your walk from infinity. When it hits a new square, add that square. And so now you have kind of a random medium, and you're growing a fractal in that. And you might ask, you know, are there coral reefs, snowflakes, lichen crystals, plants, lightning bolts, anything else whose growth rates are affected by a random medium? You know, maybe the air is random. Maybe the, something's random in the medium. Um, if you have a random medium, what would the growth process look like there? This sounds, at first glance, like this is making your life much harder. You know, you're taking random growth, which I already told you was impossible to solve. You know, putting it on this random surface, which, uh, well, we know a lot about the random surface, but it's still a fairly complicated construction. Um, but nonetheless, you can do it on a computer, and you get these nice guys. They look kind of like Chinese dragons. And um, we want to construct the scaling limit of these, and this is what we call the quantum Lovner evolution. OK, but before I say more about that, let's look at some computer-generated images and animations. First, this is an Eden model on a random tiling like this. If you look closely, you can see the squares in different colors. Where it's dark, the squares are very dense. Where it's light, you have very large squares. And so you have this random structure. And here, this now looks much less like a ball, much wilder and more random. Here is uh, this what I call a Chinese dragon. This is DLA. And by the way, lest anyone complain, I have uh, a few Chinese graduate students who have assured me that this is indeed a Chinese dragon. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it grows its way. You remember, it, it's not nearly as roundish as what we had before. It kind of has more personality to it. But it has its kind of similar dendritic structure to it. You have these little fingers that grow. So it's kind of recognizable within the DLA family. Um, I want to show you some movies. At this point in the talk, everyone's probably ready for, for some more pictures. There haven't been <coughs> enough so far. So. Um, these are movies all produced by, by Jason. OK, so let me move ahead here. Here is <coughs> this random growth model when you have only a small multiple of the free field. So it's something that's closer to Euclidean. So this is just sort of like Eden model with a little bit of a twist. So it's a little fuzzier than the Eden model. I, I, I kind of think these things are just beautiful, the way they grow. You get, you get these kind of nice. Um, view structures. Here's a, a 
a version where you now have slightly larger multiples of the field. And you now kind of see that you start to kind of pinch off holes sometimes and then fill up those regions. It, it starts to look a little bit wilder. Um, here we get wilder still. By the way, this is designed so that in unit time it fills up 90% of the space. And because of that parameterization, as, as this gets bigger, it turns out that it seems to go very fast at the beginning. You fill up a whole bunch of space, and then it takes you a long time to get into these little holes. Wild fractal structures. OK, now let's try DLA. This is regular DLA that we had before. You know, it grows nice and pretty. Nice and roundish, not too weird. It's got personality, but not too much. But now let's give it a little bit more. This is a slightly larger multiple of the free field. And again, what's happening is it's growing fastest. It has a tendency to grow faster in the places where the field is small, so places where the squares are large. So it kind of tends to find places where the squares are large, and it grows through them very quickly. You can kind of see occasionally there's a burst as it hits a region where the squares are large. And you get these lovely Chinese dragons of various types. Here's an even larger multiple of gamma. Okay, and now we're getting, you know, once gamma is about square root of 2, it's about like these pictures, there's something special about it that we'll see later. So I want you to remember this one that's about square root of 2. It has special properties. I'll, I'll show it to you again. Um, well, okay, let's go back to the, uh, to the top. Here we are. Here, here's that square root of 2 again. <coughs> okay. so. EDA model, I mean, basically, the magic is that it turns out that even though these models look much more complicated than even the already intractable um, uh, regular DLA, um, in some cases, we can actually understand DLA better on the random planar maps than we can uh, in, the reg in the Euclidean domain. Uh, and that's using this. Uh, QLE machinery. So here's just, you imagine you do DLA on one of these random planar maps, you get a sort of growth model that looks like that. And uh, what happens is that you can imagine that you sort of do a growth where you kind of explore a percolation interface. You color your vertices and explore interfaces, but then you forget where you are, start at a new place and explore, forget where you are, start at a new place, explore, forget, explore. And this business of forgetting and exploring is something that we can make sense of in the continuum. And because of this, we're actually able to make sense of continuum analogs of these eta DBM models on planar surfaces. OK, so let me skip. Here, here's a, you grow a continuum path, forget where the tip is. Grow another one, forget where the tip is. And here, we're, again, we're growing this, this thing on top of a, a Louisville quantum gravity random surface, which determines the boundary now. And um, so what we find is that, uh, QLE is somehow the limit as you take, you know, you, you sort of jump every delta units of time, and as you take delta to zero, so you're jumping more and more frequently, uh, you get this limiting object. And because we understand that original growth processes in terms of SLE and these embedded piano spheres and exploration, all those pictures I showed at the beginning, we're actually able to understand these growth models. Okay, so suddenly, again, how do you understand DLA? Well, you start by understanding a random path. And then you understand a random surface. And then you understand a random tree. And then you put all those things together, and suddenly you have your DLA. OK. So um, anyhow, so just a couple of final words before I, I wrap up. Um, so this uh, ADA model, I want to say we, we have a um, kind of a well-defined SPDE that sort of describes the way that the growth process occurs. Um, and, uh, 
And it comes with two parameters. One indicates the, uh, the nature of the random surface, and one indicates the nature of the growth model you have on top of it, this eta. And, uh, and those, so we call it QLE with these two parameters. And it turns out 8 thirds 0 is the one that corresponds to the metric structure, which is related to this Brownian map. And QLE 2 comma 1 corresponds to this DLA on this particular uh, type of quantum gravity surface. And right now, for certain values of eta and gamma, namely those that lie on this pair of curves, we're able to rigorously construct this growth model in the continuum. We're able to say what the dimensions of these guys are, we're able to compute everything about it. All these things that were impossible on the discrete model, we can now do it in the continuum model. So in particular, that dimension, 1.71, that was so mysterious that we had no idea where it was. Here, if you do it, here we, we can say exactly what the fractal dimension is. And in fact, for everything on, on this line, we can say exactly what the fractal dimensions are. <coughs> okay, and so the final results, you know, we, we have the QLE on these spheres. Uh, we have work in progress that will then relate this to this Brownian map and show that you can prove the equivalence of Levo quantum gravity and the Brownian map using QLE. And ultimately, we'd like to use this to study also the pairs off the orange curves, uh, including the regular Euclidean DLA. That's it. <laughs>